Welcome to another breathtaking, exhilarating, fantastical episode of Disclosure brought to you by the Voice of Prophecy. Is fantastical even a word? Hey guys, is fantastical a word? They have no, actually they're saying it. no, it's, it's not a word, but I, I think it is, but it, it really doesn't matter uh, whether it's a word or not. No worries. If it's not, our guest today holds a PhD in theology, which means he can make up words. Seriously, you think I'm crazy, but if we made up a word, people would think we were ignorant. But when they make up a word, it's brilliant. So I think fantastical is a word, but if it's not, we can make it legit in just a few moments. Well, by now, if you're a disclosure connoisseur, you're prob- you've probably realized that I don't sound like Sean. And if you're watching online, I definitely don't look like Sean. Although we were at a convention here a while back ago, and, and we were having trouble convincing people that I wasn't Sean. Anyway, you're on the ball if you've already figured it out. You're currently listening and watching, if you're online, to Alex Rodriguez. I'm the director of global evangelism and the associate director of the Discover Bible School here at The Voice of Prophecy. And I'll be your guest host for today's program. Where's Sean and Gene, you might be thinking? Well, truth be told, Sean got so grumpy that we all chipped in, bought him some tickets, and sent him and Gene on vacation. No, that's not true. But the vacation part is true. Actually, Sean and Gene's anniversary is coming up, and uh, this year they decided to do something special. And if I remember, I think they haven't been on vaca- vacation for about 10 years. So uh, this, is, this is really a great opportunity for them. Now, you should have watched them as they were trying to, to prep and get everything done. Uh, over the next couple of weeks. They had so much work. Uh, I, I think they need a vacation just from the from the work that they've been doing in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but they're probably packing today, I'm going to guess. They're getting ready to, to go, which means that if Sean is still in town or if Sean shows up uh, here in, 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 the, uh, in the studio, it means that uh, that Jean got so upset at him while he was packing that he she kicked him out. That's that's what my wife does. I I typically will will put something in in the suitcase and then she'll pull it right back out because either it's not the right thing or or I didn't put it in there the right way. But um, anyway, so if Sean does show up, it's uh, it's because Jean kicked him out of the house so she can pack. So here's what I need from you. Sean's instructions to me were that I don't mess up his show. Now, I've been on the program several times as a guest, but this is my first time hosting Dis- Disclosure, and it's kind of it's kind of like when you give the car to your kid for the first time. I remember when I first got to drive the car by myself, there was a mix of excitement and fear all bundled together. You know, fear that I'd wreck it. So just pretend that we're teenagers again. It's, it's my first time driving, and you just jumped in the car with me. No matter what happens in the program today, don't let Sean know. Tell him Everything was fantastical. Is that a deal? All right, that's a deal. All right, enough of my nonsense. I'm sure that's not what you're turning, tuning in today. Today's guest is a friend and colleague by the name of Dr. John Peckham. He's an associate professor of systematic theology at the seminary uh, located on campus of Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Dr. Peckham, are you there with us? Yeah, I couldn't hear anything after the countdown. Oh, well, you are, you are on. I think we're, we're good. Uh, can you hear me? As long as you can hear me, I think we're good. I can hear you now, yes. Well, hey, Dr. Peckham, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm so excited that you had the opportunity to do that. I know that you guys are are busy. I remember my my days there at Andrews University in that uh, cold, I'm not going to say quite unforsaken uh, land, but it is it is quite quite cold up there. I'm not sure how how you survive all of that. I uh, what what district were you in Indiana? We we pastored together. For those of you of you who are listening or watching, we pastored together there for a while before uh, before Doctor Peckham became Doctor Peckham. But um, were you out there at the Madison Church? I was near Madison. I wasn't in south. I was in southeastern Indiana. I was in Scottsburg and New Albany and Jeffersonville. Okay, that's right. That's right. I remember that. I'm heading down that way uh, near the Madison Church. I think I'm actually gonna gonna be speaking here soon at the Madison Church, uh, doing some training. But but I thought about you as uh, as I was getting ready to go to go down there. Well, man, it it is exciting to to have you on on the program. It's been a while since we've had an opportunity to talk. And what I want to talk a little bit about today is a book that you published, I believe, back in 2015, uh, entitled "The Love of God: a Canonical Model." You remember that book? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I hope you do. I, I think that one was based on your on your dissertation, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, it was a separate monograph, but it was based on the research that I did in my dissertation. I kind of remember. 
uh, talking to you here. It's been some time, but uh, I've I've I still have in, uh, interest in in you know pursuing my my education as far as the doctorate degree. And I remember uh, sharing that with you once and, and telling you that I had talked to a pastor who had uh, given me the advice to pick the easiest topic and just get through with it. And I remember telling you that, and uh, you kind of laughed and said that you had done the opposite thing. You had found the, the most difficult topic and, and, and ran with that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good advice. I wish I had taken it myself. <laughs> <laughs> See this whole, time, this whole time. This whole time I've been hanging on to your much easier PhD. <laughs> yeah. But man, look at all the wonderful things that 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 it's done for you. Uh, so, yeah, I I, I want to talk a little bit about that. I, I don't think that we we talk enough about uh, about the love of God, and we talk a lot about it, but maybe not exactly from from a biblical perspective. And and so today we we have an hour or a little less than an hour, um, but we're going to try to try to iron out some some things here on on the love of God and the importance of of the love of God. So if you're ready, let's uh, let's get started. Um, your your title says a canonical model and I thought man this is a, a good place to start. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? What what does it mean to be canonical? Yeah, and this is where where the research became kind of a, a a larger work than I had originally intended, and that's what I meant when I was joking about maybe taking the other advice. But actually, I'm very happy I, I proceeded this way uh, because I have found a number of things that have been uh, edifying to me personally, and I've been able to write on this and other topics. That's great. So a canonical approach is, is basically taking uh, the view that Scripture is, is God's book, God's canon, which means that God prescribed or commissioned the books of the Bible to be the rule of faith and practice. And so when I say canonical approach, basically what I mean is that I'm trying to glean what Scripture says, uh, more, more specifically what Scripture affirms regarding whatever theological questions I might be asking, in this case questions about what God's love is like. Now this is, uh, this is a little bit off topic here, uh, because we're talking about the love of God, but when you talk about uh, God prescribing uh, the writing of of, of Scripture. Um, how's that compared to to what what some people would say? You know that the Bible uh, has been dictated or has been has been given to us exactly word for word. Right. Yeah. So I don't subscribe to a, to a dictation model, but to a model where God both revealed in diverse ways, the way Hebrews puts it, revealed to human authors a proper understanding of what he wanted them to communicate. And then the Holy Spirit guided them, without choosing the words for them, to communicate that accurately and effectively. And that's what we have in Scripture. And so when you, look, when you talk about the canonical model, then, you're going into that Scripture that, that God guided these writers, and, uh, and they, they placed uh, you know, these, these insights, they placed them in, in Scripture uh, for our benefits. So you're, you're going to the scriptures, you're going to the Bible itself and asking these difficult questions. That's right, yeah. Believing that the, the scripture was inspired in such a way that God has commissioned it to function as the rule or the measuring stick, that any theological conclusion I come to, my attempt is that that conclusion is measured by scripture and, as far as possible, uh, warranted by scripture. How much How much um, influence did... Uh, did you use outside of Scripture as you're asking these questions? Were there was there any place for, for modern philosophy or or anything of that nature to to really influence where where you were going? So there's always the possibility of being influenced for good or for ill because we all have have already been influenced whether we're, we recognize it or not. So methodologically, my attempt was to uh, privilege Scripture to even reform those influences uh, on my mind and in wider scholarship. Um, but I'm wor working in the field of systematic theology, so the questions I'm asking are coming out of a larger conversation. Uh, but I try to take pains, uh, both in the way I proceeded in the study, that is my method, and in, in my own reflecting on my own presuppositions, presuppositions and my own thought processes, I try to take take care to not um, privilege even what I thought was true at the outset. So some of the questions are actually uh, the result that I was asking are the result of contemporary conflicts among theologians. 
But even the questions I asked, I revised and subjected to revision based on what Scripture said about the broad topic I was concerned with, because I might not even be asking the right questions. Mm-hmm. Here, here's here's what I like about the book, and, and here's why why I wanted to to bring you on. Um, I, you know, I like it when we simply just ask the questions right out of the Bible, and and let the Bible right. answer those questions. And I think that the, as as Christians, that's really where where we need to be. And I and I sense that that's what you were striving for. And I, and I know I know there's always you know those biases that as you said those presuppositions those those things that that are underlying in us that that help us or, or, or cause us to go one direction or another. But to strive to ask the Bible the question and have the Bible answer the question, I think is um, is where sh- we should be. And that's that's the sense that I got when when I was reading the book. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what I was aiming for, and to really have uh, my own perspective transformed by Scripture as much as possible. And I take that to be a never-ending process, and that's part of what I mean by taking Scripture as canon or the rule, that every time I come to Scripture, I want to subject at least everything I know about my presupposition to Scripture so that Scripture can reform it. And that's what I was trying to do with this book. I have questions about divine love. I had some things that I thought were true. Uh, Many of those things were overturned by what I found in Scripture, uh, which was challenging in one respect, but also very encouraging in another, because it was evidence that, at least in some cases, I was allowing Scripture to do what I wanted it to do, that is, reform and transform my understanding to be more in line with uh, what Scripture says, as opposed to what I might think or what other people might think about God's love. We're going to run into a break in, here in just a minute, but I, I want to start talking about uh, about these chapters that you've put in here. Um, there was five essential questions that you asked right at the beginning uh, about the love of God. Uh, does God choose to fully love one, some, or all? You know, that, that's just an interesting concept. I, I've, I've not given that a whole lot of thought. Does God bestow uh, or create value? Uh, does He appraise, appreciate, or receive value? Yeah, I as I as I read through some of this, thinking about God receiving something from us. You know, that's other than my prayers and my my begging for him to to get me a new car or a new house. I, I you know, I just it's hard for me to to imagine what it is that God could receive from me. Does God God's love include affection and emotionality? Uh, is divine love unconditional or conditional? Uh, can God and humans be involved in a reciprocal love relationship? You, you, these are profound questions, and uh, and I, and I'm just uh, as I've been reading. Uh, through the book again, I've I've, I've read parts of it before, but uh, just uh, preparing for this, re- reading it again, it just challenges me to think a little bit more of of um, you know what it is that God is like. So we're going to take a quick break here, and and then we're going to come back and and attack those questions a bit and see if you can make some sense on on the love of God and and what God is like. I think this is essential. It's essential for us to understand the God that we serve. So uh, hang in there. John Peckham, Dr. John Peckham is our guest, and we'll be right back in just a few moments. searching for answers to life's toughest questions? Like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Does my life really matter to God? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers that you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter the most to you. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. Welcome back to Disclosure. I'm Alex Rodriguez, 
and uh, I am the Director of Evangelism here at The Voice of Prophecy. I'm your guest host today. Sean is packing on his way to getting ready to go on his way on vacation, which is a long-deserved vacation. Our guest today is Dr. John Peckham, and we're talking about the love of God. We've just kind of primed the pump a little bit. We've talked a little bit uh, preliminarily on on some of the things pertaining to the book that he wrote uh, back here two or three years ago, uh, looking at the love of God. And and, and John, I'm sitting here thinking about sitting at the feet of Dr. Fernando Canali. Did you ever take classes from him? I did. I took, I think, most of the classes he taught, and he was also the advisor for my dissertation. Oh, man, you, you, you know him well. I, I, remember, I remember sitting in his class and uh, discussing some of, uh, some of the Greek f- uh, philosophers. Uh, I remember talking a little bit of uh, Parmenides um, and, uh, and this concept of trying to, trying to understand being and, and what, what, it, what does it mean to be? What is being? And, and, and if I'm remembering all this right, I'm, I'm now reaching into sort of the, the crevices of my mind, but if I, if I remember some of this correctly, um, he came up with the, with the thought, um, posited that, that being was timeless, if I, if I remember that, that right. And eventually that, uh, that concept... Parmenides did. Parmenides, yeah. And, and that concept ends, ends up being, ends up, uh, being brought into, into the con- concept of God, where um, later on, I think maybe Plato and, and then Aristotle, and, and, and it, you know, God then becomes, uh, they marry these terms, and God becomes, becomes timeless. And, and as, I, as I think about that, I, I think about uh, this, this eternal, timeless realm that, uh, that we had studied on, uh, that some people have ascribed and believe, and then this world that we live in, this, uh, this world that, that has been termed the, tempor- the temporal world, and, and the chasm that, uh, that they believed existed, where one could not contact the other. So God in his timeless realm couldn't really uh, function and contact us here, and we couldn't do that. Uh, we couldn't reach up to him. I think Plato tried to bridge that with, uh, with his uh, sort of dualistic a- a- approach, uh, the eternal soul concept. But, but as, I, as I think about that, and as I was reading, reading through your book, my question was, those, those of us, those, those, not of us, but those, those who embrace that concept or, or those who, who believe in, in this timelessness uh, of God, what place is there for love um, in, in that model? What kind, of, what kind of love would God have if he can't really reach out to us in love? What kind of what, what is, is is there any need for God, uh, for love? I mean, you know, as I as I remember, I I think it was, um, and maybe I could be wrong. You can you can correct me because this has been a long time. But I think it was Aristotle that was saying that uh, that God was a contemplative God. He knows us through through uh, through his mind as he com- contemplates. Um, what place is there for love there? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So on Aristotle's view, uh, God only knows and thinks Himself. And therefore, on both Aristotle and Plato's view, who are the most influential Greek philosophers, um, God, or the One, the Supreme Being, cannot love, uh, because either He's too distant for us, from us based on His nature, or love itself involves some kind of desire, and the way they thought of God, God can't really desire anything, uh, because that would be a deficiency or a need, and God ha- can't have those kinds of things. So when Christians came on the scene who adopted that particular view of God's nature, uh, such as Augustine, who had adopted a, what's called a Neoplatonic view, uh, which is a later version of Plato's view of God as timeless, uh, which, which basically means God cannot, uh, doesn't have any experience of what we experience as time, that is a succession of past, present, and future, which also means, among other things, there can't be a reciprocal or two-way relationship between God and humans. Right. On that view, Augustine was faced with a choice. Uh, he either had to choose to say God can't love, like Plato and Ar- Aristotle did, or he had to go along with the Christian view that, that God does love. Um, and, of course, he chose that because the Bible says God is love. But then he had another choice, either redefine love so it fits that particular view of God that he had, had inherited and affirmed, or redefine the conception of God that he had affirmed. And he apparently chose to redefine love, 
And on his view, love became only unilateral blessing or hmm. unilateral beneficence. That is God bestowing blessing on whomever he chooses, and he does so in a way that results in, at least on most readings of Augustine, results in what we sometimes call predestination or more technically determinism, where God from all eternity past decides everything that happens and determines everything to happen exactly as it does That's right. unilaterally. God doesn't receive anything. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. In that model, then God God doesn't really receive anything. There's there's this this sort of giving from God. Everything just sort of comes from God, but but doesn't receive. And this concept again, as I mentioned earlier before we went on the break, this con- concept of of reciprocity uh, uh, or a reciprocal um, uh, relationship is 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 kind of an interesting concept. But as as I was reading through through your book, that uh, that's kind of where you ended up. Um, Looking at a model at uh, that that really shared a reciprocal love, a a relationship that is possible not only from God to man, a sort of a one way thing, but but back from from man to God. Is that is that right? That's right. Yes, a reciprocal but not symmetrical, meaning not a reciprocal relationship that suggests that God and humans are on the same plane of being. Uh, God is the creator and we are creatures, but that God has created us in such a way that we can reflect uh, some of what he is like, or made in the image of God, and so that we can reflect his love, we have the choice to receive his love willingly and reflect it back to him, and also reflect it to others. So it's not as if um, we are meriting anything by, by loving or participating in God's love, uh, but he does invite us and has created us so that we can have a give and take two-way love relationship between us and God and between us and our fellow humans. And in fact, those are just the two greatest commandments in the Bible. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But this is, this is uh, you know, as I think about this, you're right on, on the concept that it's, it's in a different plane. When, when God loves me, and the things that God provides for me, these, these are things that that I absolutely need. I, I need the love of God. I, I need His daily protection. I, I, I have to have uh, everything that, that, that He provides me, because I, I really can't, uh, can't take care of these things myself. And as the Christian, of course, if you look at, uh, I think it's Ezekiel 16, where the baby has been thrown out uh, um, and can't do anything for itself, and, and as humans, this is sort of where we're at. Um, but what what about this relationship between us and and God? Where where uh, if it, if we are reciprocating a relationship, he doesn't need us in that kind of way, or does he? Yeah. So in my study, I found that he has no need of us, but he voluntarily opens himself up to relationship with us. So. He voluntary, voluntarily enters into a relationship with us that affects him in a way that he makes his own, he makes our interests intrinsic to his interests. So one analogy is the way uh, in a healthy marriage where both the husband and wife, uh, you know, my joy is tied to the joy of my wife and vice versa. And then now that we have a son who's going on seven, uh, you know, our happiness is tied in large part to his happiness. Now, that's not to suggest that God is tied to us in precisely the same way, but God enters into a relationship where he is deeply concerned and cares about our well-being, our joy, our pleasure, and conversely, our pain and our failures, such that they really affect him and really affect his life, not because he needs to be affected in that way, but because he is love and it's created us and voluntarily entered into a relationship where what happens to us and how we relate to him and others really matters to him and really makes a difference to him. That, that, that blows my mind. It, it blows my mind that, that God is a God that, that essentially doesn't really need us, but created us and then is affected by that which he really didn't need in in the first place, and and, and so that that brings out this uh, this question in my mind, and and that is if if you know the world is is and I think I'm quoting here from from your book here if the world is neither essential to God uh, nor necessary to his existence I think is the way that you put it if that's true then the question that comes to my mind is 
why did God create us in the first place? If he doesn't really need us, why create us? Right. So the way I understand the Bible on this point is that, that God is love, and he wanted to create other beings to bestow and share his love with, not because he needed something. John seventeen twenty four says uh, that the Father and Son enjoyed a love relationship before the foundation of the world. It's not that he needed us in order to be love, but being the kind of God that he is, being the God that he is of love, he, out of his uh, generosity and his overflowing of love, chose to create a world uh, and creatures within the world that could appreciate God's love, uh, reflect his, his image and character to a certain degree, and enjoy him and enjoy one another. So it's all grace, actually, at the end of the day. And it's not just his gracious decision to create us and bestow his love on us, but even after the fall, even after uh, the failure and fall into sin, he, cho- he chooses to bear along with us and redeem us at the highest possible cost to himself. And that just is, according to the Bible, the supreme manifestation of God's love. And God demonstrated his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's Romans 5, 8. And, and let, let's talk a little bit about that, that, that ultimate sacrifice uh, that, that God made. We're coming up on another break, but I, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, at, the, at the ultimate cost, I think you said something, something like that. There, there's great risk in, in creating something that you don't really need. There's great risk that um, that in order to have a sort of a reciprocal relationship, and especially if you create it in, in a way that it's going to affect you, although you don't really need it, it's still going to affect you, there's great risk that it's going to affect you in, in sort of a negative uh, fashion. And this seems to be what, what, uh, what the Lord did. Yeah, there's a kind of, there's different connotations of the word risk, but there's a kind of vulnerability, certainly, sure. where God is, is going to be affected and deeply affected by what happens. But I think it's all the more beautiful and valuable that even though, though God sees through uh, what is going to occur, he's willing to pay the price anyway, because he loves us so much. And that is just mind-blowing to me. So God, God became volatile then. He became volatile to... Uh, to what could potentially happen in the future, and it was something that that he saw in his foreknowledge. He could he could look into the future. He could see exactly where all this uh, would end up, and yet he he decides that he's going to to do this anyway. And that that really blows my mind to have a God that that knows this can happen. Um, and, and, you know, the, the cost, that the ultimate cost that, that, it, that it's going to, uh, uh, t- to cost him and, and is his own life, that is, and yet he goes through and does it anyway. Incredible. Let's keep talking here after the break. We have John Peckham, Dr. John Peckham, talking about his book on the love of God. And we're going to come back, and, and when we come back, I want to look at John chapter 21. So stay with us, uh, and we'll be back in just a minute. Disclosure is just one of the programs brought to you by the Voice of Prophecy, like the audio adventure program Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a weekly Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy faith-building stories with Jake Donovan, (laughs) Mr. Simon, and others in this small mountain town. Each summer, campers visit Discovery Mountain, where they sing songs, learn about God, and reenact a Bible story with the help of drama teachers, Miss Wendy and Miss Tamara. With 24 full episodes every year and programming every week, your family will have something uplifting to listen to every week. Listen to episodes on demand and watch video features from director Doug at discoverymountain.com or on your favorite podcast platform. That's discoverymountain.com. We are back and I have Dr. John Peckham on the phone. Uh, here he is our guest. We're dealing with the love of God. He wrote a book uh, 
here a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, on the love of God. And so we're discussing some of these aspects of what he found as he looked for look at, looked at Scripture and asked uh, asked the Bible to answer some difficult questions. Uh, we were just talking about uh, God creating us, and and although he could see into the future, uh, he chose to create us anyway with the ability to have a reciprocal relationship with him. Um, and that, that of course, is incredible to me, to, to know that, uh, that God, knowing what would happen, uh, he would still choose to, to create us. Um, I'm not sure that, uh, that, that I would choose to, to create some people that I know. Um, in fact, I could probably name a few that I wish—no, uh, I shouldn't say that. Let's not even go there. But, um, but yeah, you know, to, to, to know that God loves us incredibly. And in a few minutes, I want to talk a little bit, uh, John, about that, um, that unconditional uh, concept of, of, of love that, uh, that is always uh, thrown around. But before, before we go there, I want to go, go back a little bit uh, to chapter 3 in your, in your, in your book, when, we're, when you talk about um, the, the different words of love that are used in the New Testament and the, in the Old Testament. Uh, you got this uh, agape and, and eros concept, and, and specifically what, what stood out to me was, was John 21. Where Peter is um, is being addressed by Jesus. Peter has has denied Christ three times, and and uh, and and then he went out weeping. And now Jesus presents himself at the seashore to uh, to the disciples, and specifically pulls Peter aside, and and there he challenges him three uh, three times with the question, "Do you love me?" Now, when I read uh, when I read. The portions there that you had written in your book, um, it reminded me of so many sermons that I've heard in the past, different pastors who have looked at this, and they've made a lot, uh, just a big deal, if you will, about the different words that are used, uh, and and they've they've said, you know, this this means that um, that this was a powerful love, and then the response finally that Peter can muster up, it's it's less than this this powerful concept of love. Uh, he's sort of humbled and, and, and admits, you know, he can't love in that way. Uh, but I was getting a different feeling from what you wrote. Talk to me a little bit about John 21, specifically the use of these words of love in, in Scripture. Yeah, this is one of the things that, that did surprise me when I was studying God's love, because I had heard uh, the same thing you, you just described. Uh, the typical narrative goes something like this, uh, that the word agape um, it refers to some kind of perfect or divine love, and it can refer to that. And that the, the one of the other words for love that's used often in the New Testament, uh, uh, philos or phileo in the verb form, refers to some kind of a lesser love. And as the story goes, in, in John 21, uh, Jesus asks Peter, um, do, you, do you love me? Do you agape me? Or ag- agapao is the verb form of that. And Peter answers, uh, yes, I love you, but uses the other word, phileo. And some commentators and also preachers have, have claimed that, that Peter was saying, well, I love you, but not with you know, the kind of perfect love that God has. That's right. Uh, the problem uh, with that particular understanding is that whatever else we say about this, this philos or phileo love, it's, it's often uh, people will hear it spoken of as friendship love, uh, but that's another misunderstanding. It does often refer to love within a close relationship. Uh, but the word, uh, the terminology of friendship love comes from Philadelphia, which is a combination of that word for love and the word for, for brother with this brotherly love or, or friendship. Um, so you do have the connotation of friendship, and it does refer refer to friends, um, but it's, it's not restricted uh, in the way that some people think of of that root. And a way to see that, so that people don't have to just think, this is just me saying that, is in John 14, 21, we actually have the agape word used of uh, the way that uh, the Father loves us uh, and the way he loves Jesus. But then in John 16, 27, almost the exact same thing is said, as was said in uh, John 14, 21, but this time... It uses this word phileo, this word that is often translated friendship love. And it says, uh, Jesus says, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. And in both of those cases, it's this, this word, uh, this phileo word. And so whatever else we say, we can't claim that that word refers to some kind of deficient love or some kind of love 
that's less than perfect, because in some verses, God is the one who loves that way. So it would be a mistake to say that that's somehow a lesser love, even though many of us have, have heard that before. So because, because God's love, or because the word has been used in the context of God, then, then it, has to, it has to also mean a, a perfect type of love, is what you're saying. It at least has to be able to mean that. And this is the thing when it comes to terminology of love and other terminology in the Bible. The words have a range of meaning, and the meaning depends sometimes the way they're used and who they're used of. So by definition, because God is perfect, if a particular love is attributed to him, then it's perfect at least as it's used of God. That doesn't mean that that word used of a human is going to mean the same thing in every context. So even the agape root... Uh, you can find instances in Scripture where it's used of human kinds of love that are, that are deficient, sometimes very deficient. It's never used that way of God's love, but it's not because the Word is somehow pure or perfect. It's because God is pure and perfect. And how did, how did this concept here um, help you as you were trying to, de- to decide you know, what, what the love of God was like? Well, it became very significant because uh, one of the reasons, it it, it seems to me that at least many adopted the particular view of agape they adopted, was because of a particular very influential theological study and line of theological thought that was based on a presupposition that God's love is a kind of love that only gives but never receives, which I think is partially beholden to that view of God that we were talking about before. And so, uh, in fact, this, this this major theologian, Anders Nygren, in his massive work uh, that I think many people who quote him haven't, haven't maybe read all of it very carefully, he admits in that work that he's not making a, a case for how the word is consistently used in the Bible. He's actually making a more thematic case about what he considers to be God's love, and he makes some arguments from the biblical text. But in other cases, uh, he says basically uh, the text is teaching a different different view of love in some in some books and some literature. Um, so when he's making his case, he's really making a theological case that God has a particular kind of love. Now, many people took over that view, not only from Nigren but from others, and infused that into the very meaning of the word agape. But when you compare that meaning that people have inherited from that particular traditional view, and you compare it to the way the word is actually used in the text, you come to very different conclusions. And you see a kind of love that God has that not only gives freely, but also can receive, uh, also is emotional, also uh, can be rejected, and other kinds of things that that particular traditional line of thought uh, going all the way back to the influence of Plato and Aristotle, said, well, God can't love like that because he's a particular kind of being. So I don't try to focus, there's a chapter there on on these words and terminology right. of love, not because I want to focus on the terminology, but because so many of us are so used to thinking God's love is like this and only like this, right. we kind of have to clear the ground in order to hear what the Bible says about God's love. And so this did open up an avenue, it looks like, to understanding that uh, of this two-way re- relationship. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, about this, um, this concept of, of God being able to, to receive. Um, you know, you have, you have several chapters uh, uh, there that sort of, um, you know, play off each other from the emotional aspect of divine love, the evalu- evalu- evaluative aspect of divine love, um, you know, what, uh, what kind of receiving does, does God, does God do, uh, when it comes to, to love? You know, wh- what is it that I can, that I can do that, that really he receives and, and, and appreciates and, and values? Yeah, so, so one of the kinds of, the kind of language that's very closely associated with love, and in fact refers to love in some contexts, is the language of delight. And on a particular conception of God's love, that that view we were just talking about that comes from Nigrin and others, God can't receive, he can't take pleasure in his people, he he can't, on some views, he can't even be displeased by his people because he just can't be affected by anything, uh, because God doesn't have passions, meaning he's not, at least in some, uh, in the view of some theologians, just cannot be affected by anything that creatures do. 
But Scripture says, on the other hand, things like the Lord takes pleasure in his people in Psalm 149. Um, we're told in Zephaniah 317 that in the future day, in the day when, when, when uh, he's reunited with his people once and for all, it says he will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. And that one verse has nearly all of the, the words that the Hebrew language has to describe joy. So this is describing a very deep and exuberant kind of joy. So according to the Bible, we can actually bring pleasure to God. Uh, now that, of course, raises a big question, a number of questions. How can we bring any pleasure to God? On the one hand, he's God, so he doesn't need anything. Right. On the other hand, we are fallen creatures. Well, the simple way of seeing it is the way Scripture describes it over and over again. The way that we can bring pleasure and value to God, even in our fallen state, is through the mediation of Christ. That's okay. why First Peter 2 says things like we can offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. We can be pleasing in God's sight only by faith. So it's only by faith through Christ that we can please him. It's not because we have something of value that we can bring God that he needs uh, in order for him to, to increase in value or anything like that. It's more analogous to the way that my son could bring me a gift, even a gift like on Father's Day that was bought with my own money, maybe even the ugliest tie I've ever seen that intrinsically of its own self has no value to me. Yeah. But it does have value to me because he brings it to me, because he offers it to me freely. I've got a lot so of those. So not that he's bringing me something that, that he, yeah, I'm sure you have, <laughs> and, I, and I have too. Sorry, I, I uh, can just see my, my, right? my closet right now as you thing. said that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's valuable not because the thing itself is bringing me some increase of value I didn't have before. It's valuable because of the one giving it freely. And so God relates to us in such a way that we can bring him pleasing gifts through Christ that actually make a difference to him because he adopts us as his children through Christ. And, that, and that's, again, one of the, the mind-blowing, beautiful things I found. Yeah, that is, that is, that is mind-blowing. You're, you're right. And, and that brings me to, um, to some questions here. Because if we're, in, we're, we're up against a break again, but... Um, as soon as we get back, we can talk a little bit about this. But that 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 brings me to the question of if if we're dealing with something that affects God, um, that he that he experiences, um, well, that that would suggest that whatever he experiences from us, that he receives from us, is something that he didn't previously have, which begs the question then. God, who has it all, who knows it all, who who is the creator of the universe, can he receive in such a way where he is learning new things, where he is receiving something that he didn't have before? Is God growing in in some way? Uh, let's talk a little bit about that when we get back from the break. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. Welcome back to Disclosure. We are in the last portion of this program. I'm Alex Rodriguez, the uh, Evangelism Director for The Voice of Prophecy, and our guest today is Dr. John Peckham of the Theological Seminary in Andrews University. We are talking about the love of God 
And before the break, we, we ended with this concept of God receiving, the, the ability for him to receive, to, to in, in, enjoy. Um, and that, that raised a question in my mind uh, about if, if we're receiving, and, and, and uh, Dr. Peckham, you talked a little bit about, uh, compared it to, to how your son would bring, you, would bring you a tie or something of that nature, and, and that it's not necessarily that the tie is nice or expensive or beautiful or whatever it is, but just the f- mere fact that, that it was brought to you by your son you know, brought value to that. And my question is, as, as we bring, uh, bring things to Christ, this relationship, this reciprocal relationship, as we bring uh, things to God through Christ, that is, uh, is God growing? Is, is, it, is, it, is, is he receiving something he didn't have before? Can God receive, can God, uh, receive things that he didn't have? Can God learn um, new things, or or does he does he already have and know all things? Right. So so we need to separate those things out. Um, on the one hand, I wouldn't want to say. In fact, one of the positions in the book that's opposite uh, the more traditional view we've talked about before takes the opposite extreme and says that God is becoming greater all the time. He's always in process. This is called process theology. Right. Um, I'm convinced that the Bible teaches that God is not growing. Uh, he's not becoming greater. He's already all-powerful. He's already all-knowing. Um, he, 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 there's nothing that he needs, that his being is deficient, that his existence doesn't depend on anything. So I wouldn't want to say or even suggest that God is, is growing in those respects. Right. However, the Bible does teach that God can experience new things, that he does new things. And insofar as he grants creatures free will, which I'm convinced the Bible teaches that he does, uh, there are things that creatures do that are new experiences even in relationship to God. Now, I also believe the Bible teaches that God knows everything, including the future, exhaustively. Uh, But properly understood, that does not in any way compromise the view that God has new experiences. It doesn't compromise the view that God can have genuine emotions in those experiences. I think some people uh, are uh, take a view on this point that, that actually doesn't follow logically when you think about it. Some people think, well, if God already knew the events of the future, then how could he, could he be affected emotionally or be pleased or displeased when things actually happen? Um, it's similar, I think, if we were to think about maybe reading a, a, a moving book the second time, uh, the fact that we've read it before, even if we know what happens, does not mean that we can't be emotionally moved by it as we are reading it a second time. So I think it's both true that God knows the future exhaustively, uh, but he's also experiencing time as it passes in whatever way is appropriate to God. He doesn't experience it the way we do, but he does experience things. He can be affected, and it really does affect him. So when we, uh, through Christ, bring him offerings that are acceptable to him, it really does bring him pleasure. Again, not in a way that uh, brings him something he needed, but something that he does enjoy, having voluntarily opened himself up to this love relationship with creatures. I, I remember a, um, a little lady at my old church when I was pastoring, and we were talking a pr- about prayer one time, and she says that when, when she prays, she imagines the Father sitting at the edge of his seat, uh, just just waiting, um, anxiously waiting for Christ to bring uh, the prayers, for the prayers of the saints to come. And, and I haven't been able to erase that, uh, that picture in my mind uh, since she said that, the Father just sitting at, at the edge of his seat. And, and I think, you know, there's nothing that our brokenness can really give him that that's going to be exciting. He has it all. And yet, as uh, as I'm hearing you say, just the sheer mention of our willingness to come to him uh, seems to bring him that joy. Am I am I hearing that correctly? That's right, yeah. I mean, we have these, these parables of the prodigal son and others that speak about all heaven rejoicing when even one sinner turns to Christ. And it's again, it's because God has condescended to make our lives matter to him, which is in character. He is love. 
but it's not something that he was compelled to do. He does it freely. He does it willingly. And even as the father in the, in the parable of the prodigal son, you know, the story of the son runs away with his father's wealth and basically says, you know, I'm going to disown you as my father. He squanders all this wealth. And when he comes back, the father sees him far off and he runs to him and can't wait to welcome him back into his home. This is the kind of grace, this is the kind of love that God has for us. And it's not only spoken of or depicted in those parables, it is demonstrated from cover to cover in what God has done for us and what he continues to do for us supremely in Christ. Take, talking a little bit about uh, this delight and this, uh, this pleasure that he takes in us, as you studied that, um, you must have also run into the other side of, of the equation where God gets displeased. In fact, I remember reading this in, 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 in some of your writings. That he, does, he does get displeased or vexed or, or, or grieved. Um, there are some out there that, that believe some of these emotions don't belong in the realm of God. Uh, God is not an angry God. God is not a God that's going to take any any type of uh, you know action against people, if you will. Um, uh, all of that maybe um, maybe is placed on on the devil. So so God, you know, there's goodness that comes from God, and all evil comes from uh, what they term evil. And and sometimes if God takes any kind of uh, retribution, that they, they consider this this impossible for for the being of God because God is love. As, as you studied um, through this concept, what did you find about God's anger and, and the things pertaining to, to him being displeased and grieved, and, and ultimately the, the mystery of the destruction of the wicked? What, what came to your mind? Yeah, so I think the way people often think about this is a bit of a false choice, right? So either God is an angry God, or he doesn't get angry. And I think that's a mistake. I don't think God is an angry God. Where there is no sin, where there is no evil, there would be no divine wrath. On the mm-hmm. other hand, if God were not to become angry at evil, and always appropriately so when there is evil, he would not be a God of love. If I really love my son, when he is hurt by someone or something, or even when he does something to hurt himself, that makes me angry precisely because I love him. Now, we're so uncomfortable uh, with anger because we're so used to humans acting in anger in ways that are inappropriate and that are, do not actually correspond to the situation. But God is such a loving and compassionate God that we're told that his compassion exceeds his anger, anger number one. Number two, in places like uh, Psalm 78, we're told that he restrains his anger, Psalm 78, verse 38. Uh, so he's, he's never overreacting. In fact, if you read the Bible carefully, you'll see, if anything, he's underreacting to the evil that the people have brought about because of his love and his mercy. And one chapter for people to read about this is just Psalm 78. It recounts God, God's long-suffering compassion with his people who over and over again rebelled against him. It's called the cycle of rebellion. Mm-hmm. And over and over again, he came back to them in grace, and then they rebelled again and moved further and further away. And one way of reading the entire Old Testament is as a long narrative of God as the gracious lover of his people, whose love is repeatedly unrequited. This is going to amount to an emotional feeling of displeasure even for God, and of grief, and even anger, because when people cut God off, they're hurting themselves, because we cannot actually live apart from God. There's no life without Him. There's no joy without Him. So, again, if God loves us, He's going to be angry at evil in a way that is always appropriate, and He's going to act in a way that is appropriate, which includes, in the end, eradicating evil. A God who has the power to ultimately remove evil and would not do so would not be a God of love. So, in fact, when God is acting in judgment, he's always acting in the best and appropriate way given the circumstances to bring about the best result for everyone concerned. And actually, even his judgments are judgments of love. The way the Bible says it, he disciplines his children even as a father disciplines his son. And again, we're talking about a good father. There are inappropriate modes of discipline. But God is always appropriate, always the best way. And it's always a response of love. But his anger just is the appropriate response to evil. I remember, um, I remember being on the fire department and, and using those self-contained uh, breathing apparatuses. And the same thing for scuba, scuba diving. And, 
And I've always thought of it from the concept of, you know, we've got these, this oxygen tank, and as long as you're breathing that oxygen, you're going to be all right. But if you, if you reach back and, and turn that thing off and cut your oxygen uh, away, then you're going to be struggling. And, and so many people do just that. They reach right back down there and, and turn that bottle off. And God is, God is trying to, to, to woo us. He's trying to, 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 to save us from this wretched planet that we're in. And, um, and, and bring us to to eternal joy, and and we just um, many of us just choose not to not to hear his call. We have just a few minutes, um, uh, Doctor Peckham, and and I would I would just ask here uh, because we don't have much time to cover all of the material here, but this was probably more than just an academic pursuit for you. What what is the main point? If you can just share that, take uh, uh, a minute and a half, two minutes here at the end. Can, can you just share the main point of this book, what you learned, and what we need to take home from this? Absolutely, yeah. It was it was far more than an academic exercise for me. I found the entire study to be deeply edifying personally and actually just made me fall in love with God more Amen. and more uh, by understanding more about his love. And even then, I, I think I've, I've barely scratched the surface because his love is, is inexhaustible. Um, but one of the reasons I was interested in studying this topic is because I've always been interested in uh, the, the, how to understand God and who he is in relationship to the kinds of things we see in the world, particularly uh, the issue of the problem of evil and, and things like that. So I wanted to study God's love because I wanted to understand what is at the core of who God is. Uh, 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. And I wanted to allow Scripture itself to to try to paint a picture of what what God is like. And what I ended up seeing is a a picture of God's love that was much better than what I had imagined it was, that God loves us freely, of his own free will, uh, and graciously, that he loves us in a way that our life actually matters to him and deeply matters to him. In fact, there's a language used of the compassion of God and his emotionality that is the strongest language of emotion, the kind of love that a mother has for her newborn infant. God's compassion is even greater than that, Isaiah 49 says. And so I saw his compassion, the greatness of his compassion, the greatness of his mercy, uh, that we have a decision to make about whether we're going to receive God's love and reflect it both to Him and to others, and why it matters not just for the way we live now, but really for eternity. So there's so much more to say, but that's just some of the things, um, and there's much more that, that I'm still excited about uh, even many years later. Well, thank you so much for being on the program. Uh, we We'll need to continue this this discussion. Uh, Dr. John Peckham, he's there at uh, the Theological Seminary at Andrews University. You can get some of his books uh, from Amazon.com. Uh, but remember, God does love us. He, he wants to have a relationship with us. Revelation 21 says that he wants to tabernacle with us. So he, he, he actually wants to live with us. He created us. He wants to live uh, with us for eternity. And so he has made a way for us to be in the kingdom of heaven. And don't ever doubt the love of God. He, he loves you with an incredible love that is beyond what we can understand. Well, that, that's the end of our program today. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned uh, next week for another program, another Disclosure Accelerating program. Good night.